afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Heritage Lunch and Learn on tapping into Vancouver's beer history, SFU Beer History Archives. My name is Sarah Carlson, and I'm the Director of Education at Vancouver Heritage Foundation. And I have the pleasure of being joined today with by Melanie, Richard, and Mitch. And we're all really thrilled to have you here with us virtually this afternoon. Um, so before we get started with our Lunch and Learn this afternoon, I'd just like to take a moment to recognize the diverse history and cultural heritage of Vancouver, and that the city as it is known today is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. We ask that wherever you're joining us from today, that you reflect on the knowledge of and relationship that you have with the people whose lands you may occupy. So today I'm joining from Tawasin First Nations. So those of you who may not be familiar with BHF, we are a registered charity. And one of our goals is to raise the awareness of the vital contributions that Heritage makes to a vibrant, inclusive, and sustainable community. So we use our educational programming like this Lunch and Learn, special projects, informational resources, and grants to advance the appreciation and conservation of our city's diverse heritage places and their stories. Uh, we're really excited to continue to offer our Heritage Lunch and Learn series virtually. These lunchtime talks feature current heritage projects and topics, and we're really excited to have all of our speakers here today with us to talk about this incredible archive and their connections to it. Um, so this talk is the last of our fall season, but uh, we do have a lineup of talks scheduled for the spring of 2024. So uh, we'll be sharing more about that in the coming months when we announce our 2024 programming. So we're really grateful to have Melanie Richard and Mitch here to share their experience and insights with us this afternoon about the BC Beer Archive. So I'm just going to take a moment to introduce them and then I'm going to hand things over so they can share their presentation with you. So Melanie Hardbattle is the Acquisition and Outreach Archivist at Simon Fraser University Archives, responsible for community outreach and private records acquisition that support teaching and research at the university and in the broader community. She has a Master of Archival Studies degree from the University of British Columbia and has worked at SFU since 2009. Since 2021, she has enjoyed working with the BC brewing community to acquire records documenting the industry's development throughout the province. Richard Dancy is the Systems and University Records Archivist at Simon Fraser University Archives. He graduated from the University of British Columbia with a Master's of Archival Studies and has worked at SFU since 1998. His responsibilities at SFU include arrangement and description of holdings with a focus over the past 10 years on digital archival materials. As a home brewer and a beer history enthusiast, the BC Beer History Archive represents a happy opportunity to combine work with pleasure. Mitch Taylor is a longtime Vancouver resident who has been an influential business entrepreneur for the past 50 years. Some of his many projects, including the Creek House redevelopment on Granville Island in 1972, the False Creek Marina development on False Creek's North Shore in 1973, and BC's first cottage brewery, Granville Island Brewery, in 1984. Mitch is now retired and has lived with his wife Anne in the fittingly old Heritage House on Marple Avenue for the past 46 years. In 2021, he wrote and published an autobiography titled Making Way, a memoir, which details his personal and professional experience to that time. So thanks for being here, everyone, and I'm going to hand things over to Melanie. Thank you, Sarah, and hello, everyone. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Richard and I are speaking to you today from SFU Burnaby, which is on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And I'd really like to thank Sarah and the Vancouver Heritage Foundation for inviting us to give this presentation today on Vancouver brewing history and our effort since 2021 to document, preserve, and make accessible BC beer brewing history at the SFU archives. In terms of this presentation, I am going to speak to the acquisitions and outreach aspect of our activities, followed by Mitch Taylor, who will talk about the founding of Granville Island Brewing and Vancouver's brewing landscape in the 1980s. And then Richard will discuss our efforts to make the archive accessible. So I hope that many of you had the opportunity to attend Noel Phillips' excellent talk on early Vancouver brewing history back in August. 
So while we speak of craft brewing with reference to what is going on today, and particularly the last 40 years since John Mitchell and Frank Appleton uh, brewed the first batch of Bay Ale at Horseshoe Bay Brewing um, in 1982, BC has a long history of independent brewing, and that goes back all the way uh, to the establishment of the Victoria Brewery in 1858. Vancouver's own brewing industry started in the 1880s, and within a decade, there were six breweries in Vancouver, led by Red Cross Brewery and Doreen and Marstrand. So over the years, these breweries and the brewing industry more generally have impacted the province economically, politically, and not the least in terms of cultural and urban development. But despite this very rich history, original records documenting the early years are fairly scarce and scattered. So take, for example, this photograph of three men about to enjoy some freshly tapped beer. It's labeled Dorian and Marstrand Vancouver on the back. So German-born Charles Doreen opened the Vancouver Brewery in the Brewery Creek area at the corner of East 7th and Scotia in 1888. In 1892, he formed Doreen and Marstrand Brewing Company with Otto Marstrand. And in 1900, the company merged with Red Cross Brewery to form Vancouver Breweries. So Doreen is considered a significant figure in Vancouver's brewing history. Yet I can only find two images of him online. And really much of what we know of him today is gleaned from public records and contemporary published sources, such as newspapers or journals that could tell us more about his activities and those of his breweries. So I just want to mention that this photograph came to us by sheer chance and luck. There is no provenance. We have very little contextual information about it. Well, actually, no contextual information. But based on uh, research that I've done, I'm quite sure that it's Charles Doreen there on the right. Um, but there's many questions that remain. So. Is that Otto Marstrand in the middle? I have not come across any photos of Marstrand, so that would be quite incredible if it was. Where was this photograph taken? Was it taken at the brewery? That would be incredible as well. And when was it taken? What records will researchers in the future need to understand BC's craft brewing landscape of the past 40 years? And how do we make sure that that history taking place now is not lost to future generations? So over the past few years at SFU Archives, we've been taking a very active approach to ensuring that this does not happen. So how does one go about establishing a craft brewing archives and why SFU? SFU Archives is the official repository of the university's archival records, but historically we have also acquired records from private sources that support research and learning at the university. And so when I was hired on as Acquisitions and Outreach Archivist in February 2020, one of my first tasks was to think of some new areas that we could expand on in terms of private records. And Richard, uh, being a home brewer, he recommended brewing history, and I knew that that was an area of increasing interest, and I thought that that was a great idea. So what I needed to do was go and see what's already out there. Are we duplicating efforts? So the first thing I did was do a scan of other archives in BC, and I discovered that there were some very early records relating to uh, brewing in British Columbia, but not a lot, and they tended to be scattered amongst institutions. And when I looked for material relating to the last 40 years, I did not find anything. So that was encouraging, I, I guess, for us in terms of pursuing this further. The next step was to see what records were out there. So this was actually uh, in the middle of COVID. We were all working from home. So I went online. I looked on the internet and started seeing like who is part of the brewing community. And by immense luck, 
I also came across this 30th anniversary issue of What's Brewing, edited by Dave Smith, and it had just been put online. And this issue was dedicated to the history of craft brewing in British Columbia. So it was really a tremendous resource, and it just further encouraged me that there is an amazing history that's taken place over the last few decades and that there are actually a lot of records out there that could be preserved for the future. So what I did next was come up with an acquisition strategy, which actually ended up being 18 pages long, but it was my putting down on paper what the perfect uh, craft brewing archive would look like and what organizations it would document and what individuals it would document. And then I discovered that there's actually over 220 breweries in British Columbia right now. And in Vancouver alone, there's over 50 breweries. So where to start? So this was a big question, like where best to, to get started? Unfortunately, by the time I was doing this, both John Mitchell and Frank Appleton had passed away. So I decided that I would start with the organization that had been running for craft beer or real beer since the 1980s, and that was Camera BC. So Camera stands for Campaign for Real Ale BC. So I found their website online and I sent an email in through the website and I didn't know if I would get a response, but I was extremely excited when I got an enthusiastic response back from Kayla Stiles Clark, who was the president of Camera Victoria. Camera Victoria had in years previous acquired the archives of BC Brewing historian Greg Evans. So you can see there's Greg up on the screen. So Greg, unfortunately, had passed away in 2018. And at the time of his passing, he was in the middle of compiling a multi-volume book on the history of brewing in British Columbia. And his archives is very extensive, and it consists of all of his research materials. And so Camera Victoria was looking for a home for this material, and they offered it to us. And we, of course, accepted. And it's just an amazing foundation for the rest of the archives. So we were very pleased to get that. Kayla was also very helpful in that she put me in touch with Kim Lawden, who is the president of Camera Okanagan. And Kim was amazing. She is like very enthusiastic and supportive. And she immediately sent out emails to everyone that she knew in the craft brewing community, telling them what we were doing and that we were interested in acquiring records. One of the first people she actually put me in touch with was Dave Smith from What's Brewing, and he donated part of his own personal collection, as well as some of the What's Brewing archives. And he's become an incredible ally for us in this project as well. I was put in touch with Jerry Heater, who was the founder of Whistler Brewing in 1989. And so I went over to Victoria and met him and he donated his archives to us. And while I was in Victoria, I also visited John Rowling, who's there on the right. And he was the founder of Camera BC in, well, the second version of Camera BC in 1990, and he and Jerry co-founded the Great Canadian Beer Festival in 1993. So he had an extensive archives as well. And he's also a brewing writer. So my timing was really impeccable because John told me that his children had taken him aside a couple of months previously and asked him what he intended to do with his brewing stuff because they didn't want it. So John was very pleased to hear from me, and we were very pleased to receive his material. Basically, after this, I started ticking off some of the boxes in the acquisition strategy, which was really great. Fortunately, I was able to make a 
couple of trips up to the Okanagan and meet with some of the breweries up there. And we received quite a lot of records documenting brewing in the Okanagan. So you'll see there on the right, Alexis Esseltine. So Alexis and her partner, Tim Schoon, had recently taken over the Tin Whistle Brewing Company, which was the South Okanagan's first brewery. It was established in 1995. And they inherited basically a storage room full of records, and they were contemplating what to do with this material. So Alexis was very happy to hear from me, and um, I went and saw them at the brewery and acquired quite a bit of the material that they had there. And while I was there, the original owners actually sent me an email, and I was able to go see them and get some material documenting the very early days of the brewery as well. I have to say that in general, the response in the first year was like overwhelmingly positive and enthusiastic. And within a very short period of time, we had about a dozen new acquisitions resulting in what we call the BC Beer History Archive. Around this time last fall, there were a couple of articles that came out. So Noelle Phillips wrote about us for The Growler. Dave Smith did a feature on us for What's Brewing magazine. And these two articles got the attention of the larger media. So we had Jay Durant who came out and did a piece on us for Global BC News. And I was interviewed on the CBC Radio Early Edition as well. So having those two pieces come out really created some general awareness in the public about what we were doing, and it stimulated a whole new wave of acquisitions. So it was super helpful to us. So what do we have in terms of the Vancouver breweries? Well, first of all, we have Granville Island Brewing, and Mitch is going to tell us more about that in a bit. But I do want to acknowledge Noelle Phillips. So she is a professor at Douglas College, and Noelle is writing a book on Vancouver brewing history. So Noelle and I met very early on in the process, and we discovered that we had really overlapping interests. So we were acquiring records that could support her in her research for her book. And Noelle, in turn, was talking to everyone, all of the pioneers from the Vancouver brewing scene. So it's really been a great relationship that we've developed with Noelle. So one of the brewers that Noelle was interviewing happened to be Mitch Taylor. And I believe Mitch brought out his archival material during the interview. And Noelle realized that it would be a good acquisition for us to make and put us in touch. So in terms of the types of material in the Granville Island Brewing Fonds, there are photographs. This is a photograph of the brew house uh, before Granville Island Brewing opened in 1984. And then here's a photograph of some customers enjoying Granville Island Bach after a tour of the brewery in 1988. But in addition to these photographs, we also have records such as labels, bottles, tap handles, but also annual reports, marketing reports, employee manuals that really give you a detailed sense of what the day-to-day -day operations of the brewery were like. And we even have Mitch's own speeches that document the beginnings of the brewery and how things were going with the brewery. So as Mitch's own records, they provide a very unique and detailed insight into Granville Island Brewing's operations. Another Vancouver brewery that we've acquired records for is R&B Brewing. So R&B Brewing was established by Barry Benson and Rick Dello in, back in the Brewery Creek area way back in 1997. So Richard and I met Barry at the BC Beer Awards, and we told him about our project, and he was really excited. So he invited Richard and I to the brewery, and we followed him into a uh, storage room and Barry proceeded to pull some really dusty boxes off of the shelves and open them up and this is some of the amazing material that was inside of these boxes. So we have architectural plans for the brewery, we have early drawings for labels and marketing material, we have photographs that document the construction of the brewery, 
in its early operations. We have prototype tap handles, and significantly, we have R&B's original marketing and business plan. And as a bit of a surprise to us, there's also the original business plan for Shaftbury Brewing, which is now defunct. And I hear that that's quite hard to come by. I think this is significant in terms of the fact that this is the type of material that might not often survive. Things like labels, bottles, coasters tend to survive more often because of their collectible value, but records such as these don't always stand the test of time. In conclusion, I just want to say that over the past few years, I've really been struck by the strength of the craft brewing community. Not only is passion for beer and brewing, but also the way that it honors its own history. I've really been impressed by that, and I hope that it's been apparent in some of the photographs that I've shown that this work has been a real team effort, not just the staff here at the SFU archives, but with the brewing community itself. So brewers, breweries, media, associations, historians, even Bruriana collectors have all come forward and they so generously shared their knowledge and their expertise with us, as well as their passion for brewing history. And also importantly, their records. But I also do want to say that although the, the records are amazing, one thing that I've really appreciated through the past few years has been the relationships that we've been able to develop with the community. And one of those relationships is with Mitch Taylor. So I'm very pleased to turn this over to Mitch to tell us more about the founding of Granville Island Brewing in 1984. Thank you. My name is Mitch Taylor, and I'm going to give you a short history of Granville Island Brewing and the early days of the craft brewing movement in BC. Uh, there'll be time at the end of this uh, program for some questions if you have them. Granville Island Brewing opened its doors in um, June of 1984, but I want to first go back uh, to give you better context to, to my start on Granville Island, which was about 15 years earlier than that, when Bill Harvey and I, my partner at the time, we're looking around Granville Island for properties to redevelop. That was 1969 and 70. And we were looking at the whole of the Falls Creek Basin with an entrepreneurial eye to um, develop some waterfront properties that the public could take part in and enjoy in our own city. And we did need involvement from the city and support from the city to get going. Uh, Falls Creek at the time was a mess. Picture a beautiful city in the 60s, but its entire waterfront, including all of Granville Island uh, and a good chunk of Falls Creek, all of Falls Creek actually, was uh, neglected, lined with industrial abandoned buildings, vacant lots, wharves, rotting, derelict boats lined, tied up. It was a terrible mess. It was sad and deserted, and our city needed some help. Bill and I saw that as an opportunity. Uh, we'll make this short. What we, we were lucky. Uh, we were successful. We did go on and got, get a redevelopment going on, you know, on Granville Island in four buildings called the Creek House Complex. It opened in 1972. It's still there today. The anchor project on Granville Island, the Sandbar Restaurant, is our most important tenant. The Creek House did set the stage for the redevelopment of Falls Creek in the coming decade. That was the first development on Granville Island. So now let's jump forward to the 80s. By then, the redevelopment of Granville Island was well underway. Granville Island Market opened in the mid-70s and was a phenomenal success. Our Creek House building had a Mulvaney's restaurant that you probably will remember was one of the best in the city. There were, by that time, 6 million people visiting Granville Island each year. Vancouver, BC had announced Expo 86, and there was a change in the air. We were better traveled, we had more money, our tastes were more sophisticated, the restaurant and bar scene was flourishing in the city, we drank imported wines, we uh, preferred French cheeses, we could eat fresh bagels and baguettes in the morning. A lot of you lived through that, I don't know how old you are because I can't see your names yet, but a lot of you will remember that probably. But there's some great memories from the 70s of lunch at the Cannery Restaurant in Rard Inlet or sipping Chablis at Ondine's at the Marina in False Creek or 
crepes at the crepery in Gaston. Uh, but you know, folks, in 1980, if you wanted to buy a fresh, frothy pint of beer, you had three choices, or three breweries, anyhow, with their choices. Molson's, Labatt's, and Carling's. Their stubby brown bottles all looked the same, and they pretty much all tasted the same. I call those beers ubiquitous beers. We wanted something better. We decided to build our own showplace brewery, and we would brew and bottle an uber premium beer that would taste better than any of the other beers that were in, available at the time. We decided to build that brewery on Granville Island because we knew that Granville Island was a wonderful place and we felt we could add to that experience. And we knew there was a steady flow of sophisticated and affluent customers uh, to keep coming to our doors. We also knew that because it was new and different, we would have to make the taste experience exceptional from that very first sip. I was already a successful businessman, but I was not a home brewer. So I had to do an awful lot of research and planning. Being a businessman, we had to put together a complete strategic plan and an operating business plan and gather around us a group of knowledgeable people who could execute the plan. And I had to come up, of course, with enough money to deliver that. We had an overwhelming checklist of challenges when you think of it. Even to get the legal rights to build that brewery, we to build a brewery, a microbrewery, we called it. Uh, we had to get the Granville Island Trust, who controls the island, the city of Vancouver, the province of BC, and yes, even the federal government in Ottawa had to make changes to the laws to approve it. They had to issue dozens of licenses and permits that let us do it. Uh, lots of them for the first time. We had to do all of it in a very competitive business environment because the big brewers were not in the least interested in letting us into their very closed shop world. Uh, we did our research along the west coast of the states where there were already some good and some bad examples of small breweries. We traveled to Europe, especially to Germany, where we decided we, we want, because we decided we wanted to introduce a properly aged uh, premium lager beer. Excuse me, I was going to get it. It's tea, not beer. If you ask a German anywhere who makes the best beer, they will tell you. So we went to the right place. All of those necessary steps were executed by 1983. And we purchased and started building renovations and uh, brewery construction in the old Lucky Paper Warehouse on Granville Island. We received our brewing license in January 84, and we opened our doors in June the 9th. There were throngs of excited beer drinkers, I can tell you, waiting for the doors to open. Everyone got samples of delicious Grand Valana lager, and we ran out of beer that day. The rest of the story is history. We were the first of a wave of microbreweries. We now call them all craft breweries. And Melanie uh, said earlier that there are well over 220, I think. So that's, that's how much it's grown that have become part of our everyday drinking and dining culture in BC. The definition of microbrewery is that it's a small version of a big brewery like Molson's. We made the beer from water, hops, yeast, and malt. We bottled it in our own distinctive bottles. We sold it in our own brewery store. We just, and also we distributed it to restaurants and pub and liquor stores around the lower mainland. We also sold uh, draft beer to licensed premises. But other than to take a tour and to get a free taste of our product, the microbrewery license of that day did not allow us to sell customers a drink, a beer to drink on the premises or the food to go with it, not like it is today. That law didn't change until 2013. And when it did, it provided the additional profitability for the brewery for the rapid expansion of craft brewing in BC. Since 2013, Craft breweries can not only sell beer to take home for consumption, but they can drink it on the premises. Craft breweries have become a desirable destination for people in Vancouver and people in the lower mainland and all of BC, actually, to drink beer, visit, eat good food, and listen to music. Uh, I also need to acknowledge at this stage that the grandfathers of the craft beer movement were John Mitchell and Frank Appleton, and they did brew beer, ale beers, at their Horseshoe Bay Brewery for sale in their, their Troller uh, Alehouse pub upstairs as early as 1982. In those days, that was called the brew pub 
and the brew pub could only sell their own draft beer on the premises. So they could not sell retail for others to take home. So that was the major difference between the craft brewery that we wanted to build and what they were doing. My business training, though, told me to keep good records, and I did. Of all the affairs of Granville Island, up until I sold my interest in the mid-90s. Unfortunately, many boxes of, that sat in our basements were eventually thrown out, and I threw out too many, obviously. But thank goodness for the SFU archives. They heard about me, and they offered an opportunity to donate my remaining Granville Island brewing documents and materials to the BC Craft Beer Archives. I was very happy to do it. It's a great comfort to know that those records are going to contribute to the history of the craft brewing industry in BC and are available for everyone and in perpetuity. It's a very important uh, word to say. I proudly can say that the Granville Island Brewery's early history is now in good hands and will be forever. Thank you, SFU, and thank you, Melanie and Richard. My name is Richard Dancy. I'm an archivist at SFU. And what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to look at the, sort of the brewing collection or archive from the standpoint of access and use. So you're a researcher, you're interested in the history of Vancouver brewing, you've heard SFU has some stuff. So how do you find out exactly what we have and how do you go about accessing it? What's available online? What isn't? What are some of the issues you might find? So that's what I'll sort of talk about. I'll take a quick look at our access systems on a finding aid. Try not to get lost in the weeds there, but sometimes I can't help myself, but I'll try. And I'm going to take an example of one of our holdings, the Greg Evans phone, which you know, Melanie's mentioned, both as a way of illustrating some of the kind of access issues you might encounter, but also because it's just such a great source for early Vancouver brewing history. So how do you get to our stuff? There's two main kind of pathways. One is shown on the left there, it's our online catalog. It's called SFU Atom. The other on the right is much more specific to the brewing records. And we've it's a thematic guide on our website called the BC Beer History Archive. Both kind of complement each other. The Atom site, Atom stands for Access to Memory. It's the name of the open source software that runs our system, but it's basically our catalog of description of all our holdings that are processed. So it's it's all the university records, it's all of our privately donated materials, which includes, you know, the, the brewing stuff is just a small subsection of that. And it's also a platform we share with special collections and rare books at SFU. So that's a different department. They're part of the library. We are not, but we both acquire archival materials and we put them in the same spot. So, you know, as a researcher, it's kind of great. It's all in one place, but it also means you can be kind of overwhelmed a bit with some of the results when you do a search. So just a quick sort of example. If I search on the term brewing or brew here, you can see 737 results, which is like it's a lot of records to click through. And it's a bit misleading in the sense we don't have 737 collections. We really right now have four or five are in the system. So what you're kind of seeing there is the archive collection plus all the parts are described. And so figuring out how to navigate that isn't always straightforward. And the other thing you might be left wondering is like, is this everything? Do I have to put in other terms and so on? So, you know, Adam is is great, it's, it, but there's a bit of a learning curve to it. And it, it's kind of great for zeroing in on the trees, but getting a sort of high bird's eye overview of the forest isn't always so easy. So it was to kind of remedy that, that we created this BC Beer History Archive because it can really focus in on just the brewing records. So. I think it's kind of the best way to start. It's the best place to go into it. There's a, you do get a precise overview of what we have. We flag what's new and what's changed. And there's also some information here that is a bit different or is actually not available in Adam. So I'm gonna actually just flip over here to that website. It doesn't really have a, unfortunately, a snappy URL that's easy to remember. You can see it's a bit of a mouthful there. If you Google BC Beer History Archive, this will come up right to the top usually. and you know, I'll just say a, a thing about the name, you know, Melanie's mentioned Dave Smith, so he really kind of bestowed the name on us um, when he wrote his his pieces, and we we liked it, so we we kept it, we've kind of shamelessly stole it, but we always, we always want to give Dave credit because we don't want to anger Dave, he's been a good friend of the program, but I'll just quickly walk through here what's, the, you know, the navigation is along the top there, so the holdings tab, this kind of tells you precisely what we've acquired in terms of brewing archives. Um, if they've been arranged and described, there's a little blurb on it, and there's a link to the detailed finding aid. 
So what's also here that is not on the Atom site is information about acquisitions that haven't yet been processed. So that's good to know. You can kind of see what's coming down the pike. You can also like, there's always a time gap in an archives between when we acquire something and when it's available. Like at SFU, for example, in the archives, I think our backlog, it's, it's like a, a kilometer if you put all the boxes side by side. So it's, it's huge, but you can request access. It's not our favorite thing in the world to do to provide it, but we can cope. We can usually work something out. And so that's what's, so that's what's in there. Uh, links and resources. So I'll say a few things here. We have a, a sort of a timeline of breweries in BC. So these are all, every brewery in BC is listed here with its start end dates. It's color coded by its region. I guess what surprises me when you go through this is just how many there were, right? Like it's, it's a ton. Also how short lived a lot of them were though as well, which is kind of interesting. So that's, you know, this is kind of crude. It's not anything fancy, but it kind of points to something we want to do more of in the future, which is a sort of idea of visualizing data. Like our, the archival holdings have a lot of data about BC brewing history, it would be nice to kind of get it out in visual formats, whether it's a timeline like this, um, a map, or there's also the sort of graph databases where you can kind of visually see relationships between people, breweries, places, and so on. So that's kind of something in the future that we want to pursue a bit more of, but so hopefully keep your eye on that. I'll just go back through here quickly. I won't say a whole lot about Melanie talked about this. This is if you want to read more about the program, there's information here. Our, our five minutes of fame on global is linked there. You can watch it. It's quite exciting to have drones flying around the archives. We've never had that before. It was nice. Hmm. <laughs> um, let's donate materials here. If you worked in the brewing industry and you have records, you know, if you were a collector and you have material and you're looking for a home for it, like, let us know. Uh, don't listen to your kids. Don't listen to your grandkids when they say, throw this chunk out. Nobody's interested. Like, like we're interested. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that we're looking for. Also, as a researcher, it gives you an idea of what kind of materials and information you'll find in the archives we've already acquired. So that's essentially the site. I want to go back here now, maybe zero back to one fall in particular, Greg Evans' archive. And I'm going to click the link to, this is now his detailed finding aid record. And I'll spend a bit of time going through this. I'm just keeping my eye on the time because I'm cognizant that we don't want to leave time for questions. But what you're looking at here is the full description. You know, we call it a fall, but I'm using the word Greg Evans fall and Greg Evans archive kind of interchangeably. But it's the basic idea that what his archive represents, it's all the documents that he acquired or accumulated over the course of his lifetime and kept together. So it's stuff that he himself authored, if he kept a copy, but it's also all the stuff that came in, you know, the incoming correspondence, it's materials that he collected. So that's kind of the way in which archives and libraries are different. We're not really, libraries kind of focus on the items. What we have to focus in the first place is these aggregates of records, it's the archive as a whole. And that's what the description starts with. Who was Greg Evans? Why is it interesting to you? So you can find out a bit more about the creator down here. There's always going to be uh, a little history of the archive creator. I, I won't say a whole lot here. You can read more, but I guess for our like Evans worked as a he worked in the heritage sector most of his life. He passed away in 2018, but he was really kind of alongside that, sort of the foremost historian of, of brewing in in BC for BC history. His thesis in 1991 was completed, called the Vancouver Island Brewing Industry, 1858 to 1917. And a copy of that you can find here in his archive and you could download it, but it really is still kind of the definitive work, I think. So yeah, you can download it, read it. it. It still hasn't really been surpassed in terms of the depth of detail and so on. After he completed that thesis, he, he didn't go on to become an academic, but he carried on with his research. And, uh, you know, he was a prolific sort of public speaker and by all accounts, a really entertaining one. And the text of his talks are kind of here, or some of them that survived. He also worked from time to time as a historical consultant, various projects, including for Vancouver. Um, in the late 90s, I guess there was that uh, redevelopment of the old Vancouver brewery site on Arbutus. And so Greg acted as a consultant on that. And there is some information about that. These are pretty interesting files, these ones here. The other thing, I guess, the, the big thing, and Melanie's talked about it, is his book. So in 2011, he entered into a contract with the Royal BC Museum to produce this projected three-volume history. It was going to be called the, the History of Beer Brewing in British Columbia. 
Um, unfortunately, not completed. So when he passed away, I think the hope among the, the, the camera folks who got his records, the, the hope that maybe the manuscript is there, but it wasn't. And by the time it came to us, certainly access to his personal computer was long gone. So was it there? I don't know. I, I kind of think based on what did survive, probably not, but it, we don't really know. Uh, but what is there? So, you know, there's records about his education, there's records about his talks and so on that I've shown, but at the core of it is really this series here. His, it's all his research files. This makes up about 80 or 90% of the, of the bulk. And you can see the way we've organized it is by region, but I mean, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but you can almost say like for almost every historic brewery in, in uh, BC, there was a file for it. So maybe not entirely true, but pretty close. So a lot of information in there. And the kinds of stuff that is in his files, it's it's his notes, it's correspondence he would have had with other cor other historians and collectors about a, a brewery or a family. Or, you know, there was also stuff on individual brewers here. Uh, sometimes he was able to interview people who were either the, the folks themselves or their descendants. So there'll be the transcripts. Uh, there's articles and newspaper clippings that he acquired. <clears throat> he went around to archives and museums and libraries across the province where he corresponded with them to get copies of original primary sources. And those are collected in here. So it's a really kind of like thousands of hours of research kind of represented here. The other thing I guess that, that is in here are <clears throat> sort of drafts of profiles he was developing. And I think that was what was gonna go into the book. So you, uh, you can see he was editing them continuously. He was circulating them for comment. So we don't have the book, but we do have fragments of it and, and they're in there and they can definitely be built on and um, pretty interesting stuff, I think. So I guess maybe one thing I do wanna point out here is what's available digitally. So you can see at the top here, there's a few files that are, it's not very many. There's five, five right there, which doesn't seem like a lot. But one one thing, I, so these are things that have been digitized. Um, one of the conditions for us getting the, the archive was that we agreed, we committed to digitizing as much of the research materials that we could and making it available online. And that is in progress. There's about, I think there's about 400 files altogether in the in the archive, and I think we've identified about 350 that we want to digitize. We've done batch one, and that's 100, but 125. So a good third of it has been digitized, and we're in just in the process now of sort of clearing permissions, and hopefully in the early next year we'll put those online. So there should be a like a lot more coming if you to, to keep your eye on, you know. Sometimes people say, oh, you know, why isn't it all online? Just digitize it all. But there are the, the three main sort of obstacles. It sort of shows up here if you look at the, the thesis record. But the three main sort of things that we have to deal with are protecting third parties, personal privacy, there's copyright, and there's repository permissions. And some of these you can see here. So you can see this has been redacted. We've redacted here as signatures. That's kind of standard with thesis when libraries put them up. So, um, I guess our main concern is like Evans was corresponding with people who are his contemporaries. We don't want to put their email addresses, their home phone, their home phone numbers, their home addresses online. There's it's kind of a creepiness factor, and it and they don't consent to that, right? So we do have to review in detail and and redact that personal information, and that happens. And you'll find that when you come across our files, copyright. When you click on a thing, you'll often get this copyright notice because. Even with Evan's own stuff, we don't actually own copyright. When Camera Victoria acquired the records, the copyright was not transferred. So when they gave the records to us, we don't have copyright. So not only Greg's stuff, but also all the third parties whose works he's acquired, we don't own copyright. So what we do is we kind of rely on fair dealing under Canadian copyright. You'll get this notice, it will say, you can use it for your personal research or study, but if you want to do something else with it, it's up to you to figure out or to contact the donors, get permissions you need, and we'll help you with that, but we we don't necessarily have all that information either, right? So that's an issue. The other big thing is, I'm gonna go back, that's just what, when you get the full document. The other issue, I guess, that really comes up with Evan's stuff is repository permissions. So because he accumulated copies of materials, 
that are held by other repositories is usually a terms of use agreement that would say, okay, you can, you can use this for your own use, but any other use requires an additional permission. And so us putting it online would be an additional use. So we are respecting those agreements. We're going to have identified about 25 to 30 institutions that I kind of need to contact to say, hey, we want to put some stuff up. Are you good with that? And that's, that's the next step. And once that's cleared, we'll actually get the materials online. Some stuff I've covered. I just so I'm going to end here because we're down to about ten minutes and we want time for questions. But I did have a few slides. I'm just going to really comment on one. This is from the Evans Fall. It's kind of my favorite record in the fall. Like you know, as archivists, we don't we're not supposed to have favorites, but sometimes we do. <laughs> it's so banal this record, but I really love it. And the reason I like it is because it's it's uh, Evans. It's his diagramming out where the uh, San Francisco and Red Star breweries were located in Brewery Creek. So San Francisco Brewing was one of the first breweries, 1888, uh, just uh, up the street from what Melanie was showing, the uh, Vancouver Brewery and the Durring and Marstrand. Uh, it was founded by Henry Rifle. It only lasted six months, and then off he went to Vancouver Island. He came back later. Subsequently, the Red Star Brewery moved in, probably on the same premises. Uh, but nothing, again, only lasted like maybe a year, year and a half, something like that. So nothing is really, not much is known about those breweries. There's no artifacts, there's no bottles, there's no labels, there's no business records. And sometimes you'll find, it's not even totally known with certainty where it was located. So sometimes you'll see Maine in 16th, sometimes you'll see Maine in 10th, sometimes the northeast corner of Maine in 11th. So what Evans has done, based on his research, he's firmly located at, at uh, the southeast corner of Maine and 11th which today is the site of the um, Winona apartment buildings, which is where I've lived for the last 15 years. So anyway, that's to me why I, I kind of get a kick out of that. One thing that's kind of interesting, like it just kind of shows the depth of sort of detail and local detail that you can find in these records. This is true in Vancouver, but it's also true for all the communities he was studying. So Vancouver Island, the North, the interior, and so on. Um, had a few other things, but I think I'm just going to, this is maybe kind of interesting. There is a lot of stuff in the Evans Fall sort of as a sideline relating to the temperance movement and prohibition. Uh, and what I guess really surprised me is how long that sort of impulse kind of lasted and like, you know, um, and it really shaped the, the brewing industry. BC government liquor stores came up after prohibition was finally lifted. The whole beer parlor thing was a result of a referendum in 1924, but even in 1952, there's still a referendum on whether those beer parlors could serve alcohol and wine beyond beer. So anyway, just interesting, lots of information in the fall that deals with that, um, if, if you were interested. But I think I'm going to end it there. We've got five minutes left, so that's good. So maybe we can get some discussion. There's our email addresses if you do have questions for us after this event. So I'll turn it back over to you, Sarah. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much for that really in-depth look. Uh, that was such a fascinating journey to look at how the acquisitions came about and to get Mitch's kind of personal take. And I love when you find things in, in archives and they, you have a personal connection to them. So Richard, that was that was a lovely little short story you shared about your 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 favorite piece in the archives. There aren't any questions in the chat right now. So if anyone who is in the audience would like to put one in there please feel welcome. We do have a couple minutes for that. Otherwise, I will turn it over to our presenters if there was something that you wanted to mention that you didn't already kind of talk about during your talk. I guess one question that really interests me, like we kind of think, you know, we have this image like Brewing World, there was that whole sort of desert that Mitch alluded to of there's only Molson's, Labatt's, and O'Keefe. Uh, but how did we get into there? That, that's a really interesting. So the Evans Fall is, is a good sort of evidence for it just and what I've sort of always wondered like I think there's sort of the idea of prohibition happened there's lots there's lots of breweries and you had prohibition and then you had the nationals came in and soaked everything up but what's interesting when you look at that timeline is how many breweries like those consolidations were already happening before World War One. you know by 1912 there's really only one game in town in Vancouver that was a Vancouver brewery so they'd already absorbed and I what I sort of wonder is where in that trajectory from a lot of locals to regional giants to national giants when did the beer turn to schlock it would be sort of interesting. I, I don't know. It would be interesting to get those recipes and to see how, how that happened. And um, yeah. Hey, Mitch Taylor here. You still have to remember, Richard, that uh, you may call it schlock. I may too, but they do still produce about 95% of all the beer in Canada. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, has there been a lot of interest in terms of people? I know no, you mentioned Noel, who's writing the book. Um, have there been a, has there been a lot of interest since there's been a lot of attention from the media? Yes, definitely. We actually had a fellow that came out uh, to see us, and he is creating a walking tour of Vancouver brewing history. And he was really keen to look through all of the records to see what he could use for his walking tour. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I think uh, we're still just getting the word out uh, that things are accessible as well. Absolutely. Someone had asked in the chat, what about Dick's Capilano Brewery? There is uh, some stuff on that. Yeah, if you go. So I, I believe that that was uh, set up by Fritz Sick, who came into Vancouver in the 30s. There was a big legal dispute for him to actually get into the Vancouver. Um, they started out down in, I think, on Powell Street and then moved to that place on at Burrard and right by the bridge there. And then it, and that's the, the later became Molson's and so on. But there is some material on that. Where is it here? I will find, it will be in here. So there's, there's there's a file there. And there are some photos which will hopefully come quite when when that first batch of digitization gets cleared. There are some photos and there is some material about that. Uh, so yeah, it was a interesting episode. You know, yeah, it was, a, it was a huge brewing, especially after Prohibition, it was there. So from mm -hmm. the well, 30s on, yep. Yeah, they said they sponsored the baseball team. Yes. <laughs> And we do have photos, I think, of that. Um, I just don't have them handy. So yeah, but no, that'll coming. be that'll yeah. be great to have access to. Yeah. Like you said, like it's it's interesting to for for I think everyone to understand the process that you go through in order to get things online. Because I think in this day and age, we are so used to having access to information really easily, yes. and so understanding those barriers and and the time that it takes to um, kind of get things up. Yeah. Especially because a lot of those, so I, I think some of those photographs will show up at Vancouver Public Library and Vancouver Ar City Archives. So for us to put them up, we usually want to make sure they're good with that if they have the hold the originals. Yeah. There are some though in in Evan's stuff. There are some original photographs that I think people haven't seen a lot of, and that's because when he was interviewing families, sometimes people gave him stuff. So there is some original stuff that doesn't, you know, doesn't show up everywhere. So hopefully that'll be. It's coming <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. yeah amazing well thank you all for sharing today this afternoon this has been a really fascinating lunchtime talk um and i just want to say thank you also to uh everyone who joined us this afternoon um i hope this has piqued your interest in delving more into uh local beer history here in vancouver or wider in, in bc if you're interested in vancouver's history or heritage more specifically Feel welcome to explore Vancouver Heritage Foundation's website. We have our Heritage Site Finder. Some of the sites that were mentioned, the Daring and Martian Brewery are on there because they're heritage buildings. The Winona Apartments that Richard mentioned are on the Heritage Site Finder as well. And then we also have our Places That Matter Community History Resource. If you want to stay up to date with what VHF is doing, our e-news and our website and social media are the best way to get in touch with us. So thanks again to... Richard, Melanie, and Mitch, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Sarah. Yep, thanks very much. That was great. Bye.